So structural proteomics. Um, we're, we're unashamedly a, a peptide-centric uh, approach to, uh, to structural uh, characterization by mass spec. Um, and there's sort of three general approaches you can take to that. Covalent labeling of, of peptides uh, on surface uh, accessible, accessible amino acids. So, you, you know, you can do that specifically with things like uh, NFL malayamide or something like that. Or um, there's a technique that's gaining a little bit of following is FPOT, this fast photo oxidation of proteins. Um, there are a lot of people having a go at that now. It's not quite as easy as, as they might make it sound, um, but a lot of people are using that. Um, the, the two approaches we take are chemical cross-linking, and I'll talk about that at the end, and hydrogen deuterium exchange uh, mass spec. Um, and with that technique, we're looking for global exchange, solvent accessibility, so we can have a look at it a little bit at secondary structure. And um, for, for the, for the cross-linking, we're sort of getting some distance restraints for protein-protein interactions. And that's all leading into um, cryo-EM, crystallography, and NMR to try and help uh, improve resolution of structures there and get some insight potentially into uh, where subunits interacting, where you might not have some density in your, in your, e in your EM uh, uh, classifications. Okay, so what we're not doing is native mass spec. We have the capability to do na native mass spec, but we're not really going to talk about that today. So, you know, native mass spectrometry, really what you're doing is, is transitioning large molecules into the gas phase. Um, and if you get your complex, your megadon complex into the gas phase, you can then excite it and knock subunits off and get some information about, um, about, about how, how those are arranged. Um, Carol Robinson is, is the classical lady doing this, and she's done quite a bit of that with Laurie's group and, and others, Kiyoshi's in the past. Um, we, we can do that here, and we've done a little bit with David Barker's group, but we're not so advanced in that here. Um, so uh, HDXMS, the, the, our first thing we'll talk about, hydrogen deuterium exchange mass spec, has really gained in the last, over the last, uh, uh, well, couple of decades, really. You can see the number of publications has gone up uh, significantly over that period, and that's, that's generally, as it's moved out of the sort of uh, um, uh, being for, for very for people who are really focusing on the technique and learning out how it works into uh, into in, into sort of more commercial equipment that you, instrumentation that you can that you can now uh, uh, it's a bit easier let's say it's not easy but it's easier. So what can you, what th kind of things can you look at with uh, with HDX? Well, here's just a, this is this is taken from from Glenn's Nature Methods paper. Um, from a couple of years ago. So, you know, we can look at protein-protein interactions. We can look at conformational changes. Uh, let's say looking at uh, an antibody binding hemagglutinin. You can look at conformational changes in the antibody, allosteric effects. We can look at uh, conformational changes that take place when a protein binds to a membrane. Um, so there, there are a number of things we, we, can, we can look at. It's a very versatile technique um, and, and, uh, and has a wide number of applications. So what I'm going to do today is just to a little, tell you a little bit about how we go about it, um, some of the theory behind it, and, and, and then how we, how we collect the data. And then I'll, I've got three examples of how we've used it. So one is to look at how a, a, a PTM affects conformation. Another one is to look at, uh, a, 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 how to elucidate the mechanism of, uh, of activity. And another one is to look at how um, a protein's conformation is changed when it binds to a membrane, okay? So hydrogen to tumor exchange, what are we doing? Well, uh, what we're doing is we're taking a protein or a protein complex and we're putting it into uh, a det deuterium oxide, so D2O, okay? Uh, a D2O containing buffer. And then we get exchange of the amide, these hydrogens in red, the, the amide hydrogen or the backbone hydrogens uh, in the protein structure. Now, the reason we can look at these is that for one, they exchange at a rate that is sort of on the millisecond level, but importantly, we can quench that exchange reaction by altering the pH. And by altering the pH rapidly, we can, we can prevent any further exchange. So we can measure, because the exchange rate is in the millisecond to second level, and we can quench that with pH, we can look at these, um, these hydrogens. Uh, the other, other hydrogens, of course, on, on, on the peptide are in, in green. You've got your C alpha and you see beta hydrogens here, which essentially don't, don't exchange. And then in blue, you've got your, your side chain hydrogens, which exchange so fast, um, and we don't have a mechanism of quenching those, so we, 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 we can't measure those. You can look at them in the gas phase, but that's, that's, not, a, that's not something that we routinely do. So we concentrate primarily 
on these uh, amide hydrogens of the peptide backbone. Okay. And what we're looking at here, of course, is, is solvent accessibility. So you can imagine on an on a, on a, on a unstructured region of the protein, it's the, 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 those amide hydrogens are going to be very solvent accessible and will exchange rapidly, whereas regions of alpha helices or beta sheet secondary structure, they're not going to exchange so fast. There's going to be hydrogen bonding there and, and, and the exchange will be slower. Okay. So, so, so the exchange, as I just mentioned, is dependent upon pH, but also temperature. So if you focus on, on the backbone uh, amide hydrogen, see the red curve, you can see that what we normally do is carry out the exchange at a sort of physiological pH, sort of up here, sort of between seven and, 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 and eight. Uh, so with exchange around here where, where it's reasonably fast, okay? And then once exchange has taken place, we rapidly reduce the pH to 2.5, where you can see the exchange is at a minima here, okay? We drop the pH here, and you've got a sort of a three orders reduction in, in, in deuterium uptake. And then we, uh, once the pH is dropped, we snap freeze it immediately into liquid nitrogen. And you can see here that again, you know, we're, we're, we're doing exchange around here, but then dropping the pH rapidly to zero, we get a, 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 a marked reduction in, uh, in, in uptake of, of, of deuterium, okay? So we can then freeze the reaction, okay? So what, what are we actually looking at? Here's I mean, a little bit of the mechanism. Essentially, you're looking at, 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 uh, at uh, uh, the replacement of this hydrogen for well, reaction of that hydrogen with this deuteroxide ion. Okay, so this is the kind of mechanism that you have here, replacing that hydrogen with deuterium. Um, but the, the, the rate, and that is the rate limiting step of the reaction, okay? That exchange of that hydrogen. And, and it's what's, what is rate limiting about it is that if it's accessible, it's reasonably quick, but if you've got hydrogen bonding, um, uh, you know, taking place in, in secondary structures, that's, that is reduced, okay? Um, and so the, so the rate of exchange, that rate limiting step here is dependent upon pH, temperature, and hydrogen bonding, okay? Right, so here's what we do. We um, uh, add the, the protein and protein complex into, a, into a, a D2O buffer. We label for specific times. We then quench that reaction, digest with pepsin. Now, why we want to digest with pepsin, a, a, an un, relatively unspecific enzyme creates lots of peptides that we can then um, have overlapping uh, sequences within the structure, okay? So we can get some improved resolution. Uh, and we then analyze that uh, on, on a on gradient uh, LC and look at the, the peptides uh, of the uptake of, of deuterium in the peptides in the mass spec. Uh, this is the kind of thing you get where you have um, uh, an unprotected peptide here and, and one that's, that's showing protection after, after uh, um, it's formed a complex and then we, we can map that onto the structure. Okay, so um, This is this is just a, a TIC of of um, of a peptic um, uh, pepsin map, a peptic peptide map of of a complex. Uh, and here you've got you can see from the gradient this sort of relative abundance on the y-axis and the x-axis we've got tie. So I mean you might not have, have appreciated before when we do a classical proteomics experiment. The gradient is about an hour long, half an hour to an hour long. Okay, and we can stretch that out. To, to get improved resolution and identify more peptides. What, what we can't do with HDX is to lengthen that gradient of separation because the, the big problem with HDX is back exchange, okay? So once we've carried out the reaction, reacted the amide uh, hydrogens with deuterium, as soon as we put them into an aqueous buffer to run the LC, they start to exchange back, okay? So on the system that we run, back exchange is roughly at about 20, 22%. So what we, to, to alleviate that or try and reduce it, we run a very fast gradient or a relatively fast gradient. The metabolomics guys won't think it's very fast, but for, for peptides it is. So really the whole, the, it's all over in about 10 to 12 minutes, okay? And so uh, what, we, what we do with, with, uh, with, with, the, with the peptides to identify them in the first place, we take the non deuterated form and we do this MS to the E identification. So if you, if you came to the proteomics talk, uh, last week. This isn't uh, a, D a data dependent, the DBA analysis, okay? It's a little bit like a data independent, uh, in fact it's always one of the first methods. So what you do is you're spraying your, your peptides into the mass spec 
and you collect, let's say you collect data for a second and then you switch in that quadrupole and you fragment everything, you just make energy and fragment everything that's going in there for a second and then back and collect MS, another second, fragment everything. And then you align based on retention time. Okay, so you get some accurate mass retention time. So you align the fragments with the precursors. Okay, so what we do initially is to identify all the peptides that are in there in that way and get a database. And then when we do the uh, deuterium exchange reaction, we don't identify by DDA, we just do by accurate mass. Okay, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit later. But here uh, is, is with what we're doing is we're, um, it's a very rapid gradient to, to try and, 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 and limit that back exchange. Okay. Now, of course, okay, so here's the instrument that we do it on. Here's the eye mobility cell. Um, and um, but, but what, sorry, I should say, here's the instrument we do it on. This is, this is a QTOF. One of the ways we try and, and improve our resolution, okay, um, and uh, allow us to look at what would be potentially overlapping peptides because we've got such a fast LC gradient, peptides are loot at the same time and overlap and they become difficult or impossible to deconvolute, okay? So we introduce a gas phase separation, if you like, ion mobility. So normally, so your ions come in here and normally they're through the step wave, they would come through this quadrupole here and detect it in the time of flight. This would just normally be a straight quad, okay? But in here it's separated into three where we initially trap, then allow into this mobility region and then we transfer it into the mass spec. Actually, this little video, um, should hopefully show you how it, how it works, okay. Um, it's called a, a T wave or a tri-wave separation. You can imagine that you, you pulse a wave, a sine wave down this region of the instrument, this gray region here, you pulse a wave down here. And you can, you can alter the speed of that wave, speed of its travel and its amplitude. So you can separate out peptides based on their collisional cross-section or shape, if you like. Something that's very compact, it's going to go quickly, it's going to surf with the front of the wave, the red ones, or if it's more exposed or larger, it'll be retarded and it'll, it'll roll over here, okay, like the yellow and blue ones. So you affect a gas phase separation of, of, your, of your peptides, okay. Now that helps us when we're looking um, at very complicated mixtures, which of course is what we want to do. This was an experiment with Laurie's group. Um, looking at the mRNA 3'5M processing machinery. So if you imagine we've got mass to charge up here on the y-axis and drift time, so how long it took to move through that cell uh, on the x-axis. And so the, these sort of red and yellow colors here, these are different charge states, okay? These are different species and, and their time to drift through the cell, okay? And then if we look at that, so here's that TIC. And then below, if, you've, if you were then to take, to, to flip that top TIC, towards the, the camera, if you like. So we're now looking on top and drift time is now on the y-axis. You can see we, we can separate it out the ions. And, and if we then take a slice through that, so this bottom trace here, okay, now you start to see that we're losing a lot of species at the same time, okay? And we can look at those here. So at the bottom here in red, you can see if we had no ion mobility, all those ions would be eluting at the same time. And if you were to look at this sort of region around 593 here, this is sort of fairly starting to overlap. But if we then introduce ion mobility, we can pull those out, okay? And now we have the ability to look at those individually. And now when they incorporate deuterium, because they, the isotope envelope spreads when you incorporate deuterium, we can, we, can, we can incorporate those in the analysis, okay? So we use ion mobility to help improve our resolution, okay? So here's an example of how we did that. This is, so this, I'm gonna use um, Pink and Parkin to, to, to describe these. So we looked at these a little while ago with, with David Commander's group. Um, so, you know, um, two of the most frequently mutated um, 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 proteins in uh, juvenile uh, recessive Parkinsonism or Parkinson's disease are Pink 1 and Parkin or Park 2 and Park 6 genes. Um, and so uh, Pink uh, is, is this uh, P10-juice kinase um, it's, 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 it's conserved uh, across species, but the, the, the interesting thing is that the human pink one is very similar to uh, this uh, Pediculus humanus uh, corpus or this, uh, this human body louse uh, protein. And, and the thing about that is, is that you can express that highly in E. coli. Okay, so there's a reasonable amount of, of material. So pink one acts as a, uh, actually let's move to the next one. So pink one acts as a uh, I guess a, um, a detector of mitochondrial integrity, if you like. 
Um, so you know, if you have a, an intact mitochondria, so you've got a, you've got your 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 inner mitochondrial uh, potential is is intact and it's working normally. Then pink comes along, um, it gets taken in by uh, by the Tom complex. The C terms is cleaved by this presynaptic associated uh, uh, rhomboid like. Uh, um, uh, enzyme chops off the C-terminus and the rest of the part pink one is then released and, and is degraded by the protein then, okay? But if there is some issue with that uh, um, electrochemical potential uh, on the, across the inner mitochondrial membrane, then when pink comes along, it now inserts into the membrane rather than through the Tom complex. So it's not degraded. It inserts into the membrane, it dimerizes, it autophosphorylates itself, it then phosphorylates ubiquitin, which has accumulated on the mitochondrial surface at serine 65, uh, attracts parkin, uh, and parkin uh, then uh, binds to, to the ubiquitin, parkin is activated, and mitophagy occurs. Okay, so if we look at pink, oh, this is the flow. So if you like, we do all this by hand rather than 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 uh, using liquid handling. Um, so you take your, oh, get rid of this. you take your your protein. Uh, and we react it with D2O over a set time, and we do all this manually. Okay, then we quench it quickly with buffer uh, at, 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 at pH 2.4, wind it into denature, and we crash these in liquid nitrogen and store it in the in, in the minus 80. Okay, now the thing that's um, made this much more amenable, rather than doing things in ice buckets as we were doing, as well as John Burke and 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 uh, Oscar Vadas was doing when we arrived here back in 2012, is this system here. This is the Synapse, this is the mass spectrometer. Uh, I hope you can see my cursor, I'm sure you can. On the left-hand side, you've got the, the LC, these are the pumps. And this is the HDX manager, which is this bit here. And it's a cool chamber, it's, it's at zero degrees, it's flush with nitrogen, so nothing freezes up. On the side, you've got um, a place for the pepsin column, which is at about 14 to 16 degrees. But what happens is the, the sample is, is introduced, it flushes through the peptin column and onto this, where's my cursor got, onto this trap here, okay? And then the peptides are washed from the trap onto the analytical column and into the mass spec and everything's kept cold. So again, we're limiting back exchange. If we were to do this at room temperature, you know, we're gonna get 80% back exchange, it would be hopeless. Okay, and then we process the data using protein mix global server two, uh, which is water software, and then dynamics three, which again is, is some water software. Okay, so this is the kind of thing you get. So each, each dot on this represents a peptide. Uh, and at the top, you're looking at the uptake of deuterium in pink one. And in the bottom panel here, you're looking at the uptake of deuterium uh, in pink one when it's been dephosphorylated. Okay, so you can already look at several things here as I was explaining earlier. So regions where there's extensive hydrogen bonding, let's say here, you've got low uptake. So this, is, this, this will be an alpha helices. This is an alpha helices, that's an alpha helices. Something like this, where uptake is retarded a little bit, is probably a beta sheet. And, and here we've got sort of unstructured loop regions here, okay? So you can get some initial feel for um, the overall sort of conformation of your protein. And we tend to do these, um, reactions at four or five time points uh, for three seconds, 30 seconds, 300 and, and, and 3,000, so 50 minutes if you like. Uh, 50 minutes is about the longest we go out to. And we can go shorter, we can do 0.3 seconds manually. Um, how do you do that? You say, well, um, we do it on ice. And so uh, we, we call that 0.3 seconds. We say that by doing it on ice, we get a tenfold reduction. Of course, it's not a tenfold reduction. If you're gonna go into your Arrhenius equation, everything it's about an eightfold reduction, but let's not split hairs. Okay, so what the beauty of this technique is that it's, it's that looks pretty, this butterfly plot, but it's, it's difficult to gain any, a huge amount of information. But what it is, is a difference technique. So we're looking at a protein on its own and then in complex or when something's happened to it. And we take the two uh, measurements away from each other and get a difference plot, okay? So now you can start to get some information. Uh, anything above this dotted red line is considered significant and, above, and below the blue line is considered significant. So classically, if a peptide is protected from exchange, it's colored blue. And if it's exposed, it's colored red, okay? So in this panel here, in the top part of it, this is peptic peptides that are exposed when pink is phosphorylated, 
and below the line is when peptides are, uh, are, are protected and think it's phosphorylated. So you can see that there's, there's not a lot going on until we get to this sea lobe region here from around sort of 350 onwards. Okay, there's a huge amount of exposure on phosphorylation of pink. Okay, and it's Sarah carrying out these measurements. And so what is actually happening is in pink one, um, when it's phosphorylated, uh, you get exposure of, of the region here, which is in red, this unstructured region here. Um, um, but that's actually where it contains all the catalytically, catalytically important subunits, uh, the sort of triad of aspartic acid, uh, phenylalanine and glycine, and then uh, histamine, arginine and aspartic acid. They all occur uh, in this region here. Okay. Okay, so that's how a post-translational modification can affect the conformation of, of a protein. Okay, so in pink one's case, by phosphorylating it, it opens up the active site. Okay, so what we then went on to look at with uh, Christina in David Commander's lab was, was Parkin. So Parkin is auto inhibited and, and requires activation by, by pink one. Okay, and pink one phosphorylates serum 65 on ubiquitin and the UBL domain of Parkin. Okay, so it's the binding of, of uh, serine 65 uh, on ubiquitin here and the, and, the, and the phosphorylation of ubiquitin that activates the molecule. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay, so classically it's one of these ring between ring structures. It has these domains here. So this is a unique to, to Parkin domain as a ring two, ring one, in between ring, and this, this UBL like domain here. Okay. So, right, this is hugely complicated, but I, I didn't think we needed to go too much into what was going on here. The, the, what made this possible was that David um, and his group had uh, reagents which allowed them to freeze parking in specific conformations. So they had, you know, specific um, phosphoubiquitin probes that will bind, but then not exchange, okay. And, and also the, the E2, there's an E2 here that binds, but then that doesn't transfer the, uh, the, the ubiquitin, okay. So what you find is that um, on binding of phosphorylated ubiquitin here to the ring one, you get release of, of, of the UBL domain, okay. And we've mapped that onto the structure. And so you can follow these releases as it goes through. You get a huge conformational rearrangement. This UBL domain, which was over here, swings around here. You get the ring two, um, the, U, the ring two now exposed for, for, uh, for interaction with the E2. The UBL domain binds to the UPD again, the phosphorylated part binds in here. But what also became clear from this was that this region six here, um, I think they now then termed this ACT domain, but there's a number of residues here um, uh, that, that, that bind tightly here. So in, in um, strengthening that interaction and, in, and increasing the activity. So th this, the, the, this was a combination of a crystal structure with a, which was found fairly late on. The reason for doing all the HD exchange was it was difficult to crystallize. Uh, in fact, I think it was crystallized by removal of the uh, or cleavage of, of, of the ring two domain. And um, so the, it's a combination of the two approaches that elucidated the mechanism of activation of parking. Okay. Right. The, so the third example is how uh, binding the protein to a membrane um, can alter its conformation. This was this was looking at one of these um, uh, uh, Arno, uh, which is a GEF, uh, one of these regulators of, uh, of small half GTPases. So in the middle here, these um, these uh, small half GTPases are involved in a uh, yeah, number of important um, uh, cellular functions. Um, sort of membrane trafficking, cytokinesis, um, uh, lipid modification, cell adhesion, that kind of thing. But they're tightly regulated by these, uh, these GTP activating proteins and these uh, GTP exchange factors, okay? And ARNO is an example uh, of, of, a, of a GEF, um, and it's considered sort of a, a classical one. They all seem to have this sort of call, call domain, a six, seven domain, uh, a plexin homology domain, and then this sort of, uh, um, this sort of lipid binding domains down here, okay? So we were looking at Arno, um, and so the sequence coverage was pretty good. This is the kind of, I haven't shown one of these before for, for some of the others, but this is the kind of coverage you want to get, sort of approaching 90% or greater, because any region here where we haven't had a, a peptide, these are, these are overlapping peptid peptides. Of course, we're not getting any information for these regions here, which is, you know, if that's where your activity is occurring, we've missed it. So you really want maximum peptide coverage. 
And so this was interaction with liposomes. So here's just a little bit of information about the liposomes here. Um, but the, the main thing to note is that is, is PIP2. These were PIP2 containing uh, liposomes. So here again is another uh, another um, other like the, the structure here. Each a dot again is a, is a peptide, and you can see secondary structure elements here and more exposed regions here. Okay. So what we did first was to look at Arno um, with PIP3 containing membranes. And you can see there's again, anything above the red line is significant, anything below the blue line is significant. And the gray in the background here is, is the error in the, in the determination. And there isn't very much going on, potentially a little bit of, of protection of the C-terminus here, but really not much going on with, with PIP3. But then if we look at PIP2 in the membrane rather than PIP3, there's a lot more going on. Again, here at the C-terminus, there's a strong interaction here, and then uh, regions just a bit uh, more towards the end terminus here, we've got, we've got some nice interactions. And if you map those onto the, uh, onto the, onto the Arno structure, here, it actually, you probably can't see this too well, but this is in white. So we, this is where PIP2 is binding. We don't see that because it's bound in, into the liposome, okay? But what we're seeing is this B3B4 loop where we're seeing um, some protection, uh, the purple line here in the presence of PIP2. And so this loop and, 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 and beta sheet here are interacting with the membrane. And then what we see in, in this pH domain is that the linker in light blue and then this dark blue alpha helices here, there's some, there's some significant protection uh, occurring, okay? Now, uh, HDX, hydrogen exchange, is a, is a complicated mechanism, but essentially it has two kind of kinetic um, uh, pro, uh, uh, ways that exchange occurs. So, you know, most things in solution uh, undergo this EX2 exchange, where you can imagine that it, it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's a, um, uh, between a closed and an open form, okay, the kinetics of, of that kind of thing. So you've got, if you've got your, your protein, it's kind of moving reasonably quickly and you're getting exchange of maybe one amino acid at a time, but it's sampling a different environment fairly quickly. Okay, and that will be EX2 kind of kinetics. EX1, on the other hand, is, is slower, but what's happening is you've got a structure there. As it opens, it opens for longer and you get exchange of more amino acids. So you're going from nothing exchange, sitting there like that, opens up a lot of amino acids are exchanged with deuterium and then they slap back, okay, or as should I say, amide hydrogens exchange. Okay, so it's like that, opens up a bit more, lots of exchange snaps back. Okay, and that's depicted here. Okay, and so this is what EX1 and EX2 kinetics look like. So you can see here in the non deuterated form, there we've got your isotopic distribution. And as you incorporate deuterium, you get an increase in mass, and you see the, the broadening of this on like nice Gaussian peaks here. And when we look at this, we drop a sort of weighted uh, centroid in here, okay, weighted average down there. Okay, and this is EX1. So you notice, particularly looking here, let's say, there's sort of a shoulder on it. There's two populations here. It, it isn't one, okay? So there's a slight shoulder here. So it's, the, it's, it, it's not the same as EX2. And, and so homing in on that here, you can see that. This is, this is for this alpha helices here at 30 seconds. And what we think is happening is that as Arno binds to the membrane by this domain here, binds to PIP2, uh, it interacts with the membrane via this B3, B4 loop. And what you have is an unwinding of that alpha helices, okay? It's, it's not an EX2, it's, it's an unwinding of that alpha helices that then primes it ready for binding the, uh, the, the, the ARF GTPase, okay? Which comes, the ARF GTPase binds in here, okay? So by, by looking at the kinetics of deuterium exchange, we can get some information about how that interaction is occurring. So essentially by binding to the membrane, it then changes its conformation, priming it ready for interaction with, with the RGTPS. Okay. And this was a publication with Jacqueline Sheffield we had back in, in 2019. Okay, I've just said that, so we don't need to go over that again. Okay. Resolution. I've mentioned it a couple of times and I showed it to you a second ago with the overlapping peptides. HD exchange is really limited to the peptide level. So when we say 
that that alpha helices was protected. And I label it all blue. That's because um, that's, as, that's as highly resolved as we can get it. I can't get it down using the methods that I've described to a single amino acid, okay? And the reason is this, that we can't carry out collision-induced dissociation, or what can, but it yields no information. So if we were to do CID of a deuterated peptide to try and gain uh, information on where from the, from the, from the fragmentine spectra of where the deuterium is incorporated, what happens is because it's a fairly hot technique, CID, you get scrambling of the deuterium. So it moves around in the peptide backbone, rendering the information useless. So there is an approach, which I think I mentioned the other week as well, electron transfer dissociation, this non-agodic method of fra uh, fragmented ions, where you introduce a radical anion, the energy of transfer of that radical ion, anion to the peptide backbone is very fast. <clears throat> and so we can look at uh, specific residues and we can get sing on almost single amino acid resolution, okay? The problem with this is, uh, as, as with everything, you think, great, we can do that. Well, you can't because it really doesn't work for singly charged and doubly charged peptides. You really need three plus and higher for it to work. Obviously, in intellectual way, most things are, are, are doubly charged. Um, so, so and, and also, it's just not a particularly um, useful uh, approach here. So the way we can, we can carry out this on the, uh, on, on the synapse, it's a more targeted approach. So what you would do is you do your energy exchange. If there was a particular region or peptide that you wanted to focus on, you would do the experiment again and then focus in specifically on that peptide to do electron transport dissociation. So where this is, um, this is just lets you know where it is on the instrument. So here you have your, your um, peptides being introduced from the chromatograph here into the iron source. Um, and, and the reagent here is sort of lorenzine so that, that sort of has a nitrogen gas blowing it in. Uh, uh, it's sort of a, uh, a glow, glow discharge here where it's ionized along with your, your uh, peptides that they come in. Uh, and that's when you get the, the transfer. Okay. Um, and this just shows you, again, this is an MS to DE approach rather than, than DDA kind of thing. But this is a peptide that Casper Rand came up with a few years ago to look at this. And so, you know, here again, they're using pretty much the same instrument we are. So um, in, in classical CID, uh, rather, there's no scrambling here. Um, but um, if, if you then deuterate, you've got 100% scrambling. Whereas now we can, with the, with the, on the green line here, we can, with ETD, we can, uh, we can, we can look at the amino acid, okay? Right, so what are you gonna need for um, an HDX experiment? Uh, it, it's reasonably protein heavy, okay? You're gonna need a pure protein. I know Glenn and Parsons said pure-ish, but let's be reasonable. If you're gonna do it, it needs to be pure, okay? You don't wanna be overcomplicating things. Or you don't wanna have peptides there that can, that can get in the way, can mislead you and take you down a blind alley. You need the protein alone and then in complex. Okay, so if you're looking at a number of proteins, you have to have each individual subunit on its own and then in complex, so it's a different differential technique. You're gonna need 10 micromolar and about 100 to 150 microliters of that. Potentially five micromolar, but let's go for 10. The reason is that, of course, as I explained earlier, as you incorporate deuterium, you, you get a spreading of the signal and a lot of peptides can drop below the detection limit, okay? Uh, and as for all mass spec approaches, I can't say this enough, buffers are important. You know, generally the component of your, uh, your constitution of your buffers isn't an issue, but if they contain detergent and glycerol, it's a nightmare. Okay, you, it, they're, not, they're not compatible with, with the chromatography and, and the mass spec, okay? So really try and, that, that, that is the only issue with the HDX. Okay, so in the last, okay, 15, 20 minutes, we'll, we'll talk about uh, cross-linking. So the other approach we use, and, and all of these are looking at protein-protein interactions, um, is cross-linking. And, and with cross-linking, we can get some information of distance restraints from subunits, okay? So that can help you position things within, within a, uh, a cryo-in map or something like that, okay? If you don't have any information, it starts to, to, can start to align things, okay? But it's providing pr uh, information on protein-protein interactions, okay? And so what we have is a, a cross-linker with, with uh, two reactive groups at, at either end and, and space arm in the middle that can vary in length. Um, here's just two BS3. So, so you've got the, uh, this, this, uh, this sort of NH3, uh, S, uh, makes NH3 esters at, at, this, at, at either end, this succinyl group. 
um, and then you've got a, you can label these in, in the middle, which can help you to identify peptides. Okay, so they're reactive. They target specific uh, amino acids. They ta ta target primary amines, so lysines and the N-terminus. Okay, or you can have something like ADH, which, uh, which targets carboxylic acid groups. I have to admit, we tend to focus on the primary amine reactive groups, okay? The others tend to be a little bit more tricky to use. And, you know, this spacer arm sets the maximum distance that you have between, between lysine, between primary amines, okay? So th these are some of the, the different, uh, the, this is the workflow and some of the different reagents we have um, uh, th that can have different lengths. Um, and remember, we can label these carbon on this backbone with uh, carbon 12 or carbon 13, which can allow us to identify pairs, okay? And, and that, this is just described here. So if you have um, DSS, something like this, uh, like this, you can look at it in the H12 and D12 isoforms such that you can look for those pairs, which will tell you, yes, that is a cross-linked peptide, okay? Uh, can also potentially help you to do some quantification. Um, but what we're more and more using are these cleavable reagents. This is uh, DSBU, which has a slightly longer. This is something like 11.4. This is sort of 12.4, something so, angstroms in length. Um, but what it, it's a little bit um, easier to look at in the mass spec in that when we introduce the cross-linked peptide into the instrument, we can fragment that bond in the gas phase, okay? So then the experiment just becomes, this, this, this chem, this, reagent here, we can't fragment, so your peptides stay cross-linked, okay? So now when we fragment, we're looking at sort of fairly complicated fragmentine spectra, whereas here we can cleave that bond, and then really it's just looking at a peptide with an additional tag on it, much like a PTM, okay? I'll come to talk about those in a minute. So there are other reagents we can use, these sort of so-called zero-length cross-linkers, which are, are quite, they're very reactive, they're, they're not so easy to use. So the ones we're, we're focusing in on is this DSBU, and this sort of reaction here is that we can fragment it. I'll skip through these so you can see that. You can fragment it in the, in, in, in the gas phase and bet, um, dependent on which side of this aminobutyric bond it, it fragments, you end up with uh, uh, two peptides, okay? So you end up with, with peptides from, from cleavage on the, 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 the C-terminal side or the N-terminal. Side, okay, and you can use those as diagnostic peptides. We've got sequence information down here, and we can use those as identifiers for the, for the fact that it's it's crossing. Okay, so the way we do it is to take your protein, cross-link it with a chemical reagent, whichever one we've used, DSBU, BS3. So now you've got a nicely cross-linked complex. We try not to over cross-link it. Okay, so um, so that so they're actually meaningful rather than just a great big. You know, aggregates of, of protein. We digest with trypsin, as, as we do with normal peptide uh, uh, procedures. You get a digestion product. We analyze those in the mass spec. So you've got unmodified peptides, which are relatively uninformative, or intramolecular uh, crosslinks or dead ends, which have a little bit more information about them. Intra protein crosslinks can have some information, but what we really want is the interpeptide crosslinks. They're, they're the ones that are giving us all the information. And these are also called uh, not only inter, but type 2 or type 1 for the intra. Okay, so again, these, these peptide mixtures are reasonably complicated and the crosslinks are relatively underestimated in the milieu of other peptides there, okay? So when you're introducing them into the instrument, even though they've gone down a chromatographic separation, they can be quite difficult to identify. So we do some enrichment up, up, up front before we, we analyze them. And that's either, as, as here, is some sort of size exclusion, peptide size exclusion you can carry out. Well, we, we do sometimes cation exchange or a high pH reverse phase separation, which has worked quite well. Um, so there's sort of three or four different ways that you can um, fractionate your cross-linked peptides first before taking them to the, to the, uh, to the instrument. Uh, and then this is, this is sort of, you don't really need to know this, but the, the data processing route is to, to convert your raw file using this uh, Proteo wizard and then search um, we, we tend to, we don't use XQuest, we use um, a program called um, Mirox or Stavrox, which came out of Andrea Science Lab um, to identify crosslinks. That seems to work very well for the DSBU, a reagents which also came out of her lab. And then we view them on this software from Yuri Rapsovic's lab, uh, Znet, which is quite a nice way of looking at the interactions. Okay, so the example I'm going to tell you about 
is, uh, is mitochondrial complex one. This is the ovine uh, mitochondrial complex one. And this was a project we had with the uh, Sazanov's group now back in 2016, which feels like yesterday, but was now a few years ago. Um, so complex one is the first enzyme in the respiratory chain. Ah, don't do that, um, which I'm sure you all know, but it, it is sec, sec, what happens is that NADH binds at the top here and electrons are transferred via ions and FMN and uh, flavium mononucleotide and some ion sulfur clusters through this uh, globular region. Um, and, and what happens is that those are transferred to uh, ubiquinone, okay? So it's the NADH oxido, ubiquinone is reduced, okay? So you oxidize uh, NADH and reduce ubiquinone. And, and that transfer of electrons carries a concomitant transfer of protons across the inner mitochondrial membrane and the establishment of this uh, electrochemical gradient, okay, which then drives the synthesis of ATP. Uh, yeah, everybody at LMB has seen this numerous times, so we won't dwell on it. But what you have are core subunits, okay, which are very conserved across species, bacteria, all the way through. And then you have some supernumerary subunits, uh, which are, are not present in, in lower, lower species, okay. So what happened with the, with the structure is that you need to assign these in the cryo -in, okay. Now, many of the, of the subunits of complex one have uh, not only uh, regions of secondary structure, alpha helices and beta sheets, and, and, and unstructured regions, which make them, you know, you can potentially identify where they are in the structure. But a number of them, 12 of them, have a single transmembrane span, which can make them difficult to orientate either side of the membrane, okay? Um, and so what, with the chemical cross-linking, what we did <coughs> was try and identify those. So if you look here, you've got your, the globular uh, extra membranous domain. This is where NADH comes in and the electrons travel through this subunit here. And then in here, you've got your um, intriguing membrane proteins. This carries your ND subunits and all these um, hydrophobic nuclear encoded subunits. But what we could identify, if you concentrate on these, is that we can orientate these single transmembrane subunits as to whether as to whether their N or C terminus is on the matrix size or the intermembrane space. And we can do that by looking at crosslinks between themselves and also with subunits that we know where they are already. Okay. So if we were to look here, particularly at this uh, this region and this region here. Move on. So again, there we go. So looking at SGDH or <coughs> NDUFB5, you can see that's a uh, 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 no, it isn't a huge protein, but it has a couple of alpha helices. And we can position that at the sort of towards the toe <coughs> of complex one. Okay, we can position that there. And then what happens is that actually that subunit then, this alpha helice tracks along the base of that subunit. And we can identify various cross links with PGI, uh, PGIV, and B14 beta. Um, uh, uh, on the underside here, which can position SGDH in the structure, okay? And then if we look at this other region here, we can, you can see that those, that's where those crosslinks are here, and also down here, so it comes all the way through the bottom of the, the sole of the, of the complex. And then looking at MNLL, again, a, a slightly shorter here, looking at that region here, we can, we can position it here next to B14.5 beta here, okay? So that was a way of helping position those subunits, improve the resolution, uh, and gain some more structural information on, on complex one. So what I've tried to do is just show you um, very, very quickly um, <clears throat> the two approaches we take at the LMB um, and how they've been very successful over the last few years in helping uh, refine uh, and identify some new interactions of, of, of complexes uh, that people are looking at. So um, Sarah, is responsible for the uh, for the HGX experiments in the lab, um, and Gianluca, who of course has now moved um, to Austria, was responsible for uh, some of the uh, some of the, the cross-linking experiments. Um, the Pink and Parkins um, experiments were done with Dev Commanders Group, Christina and Alex Schubert. Of course, these guys have now all moved on, uh, and Arno was a collaboration with Jacqueline Cherfi uh, in in Paris. Um, that was very nice, and and Alex. Should I say Leo Sazanoff um, and James Letts, who who were at the MBU across the road, uh, and Leo has now moved to the IST in Austria, um, and so we don't have much, a little bit, but not much to, to do with him these days. Okay, so that's 
that's structural proteomics. Um, if anybody has any questions, uh, fire away. Catherine Brown, can you describe a little more about how you use liposomes in these methods? <laughs> well, that's, that's a good question. So um, those were all done by, by, by Jacqueline. So, um, and we've done a little bit, or we're starting to do a little bit with, with Buzz Baum's lab with Alice um, and Ralph there. Uh, Ralph's the, the guy for, for, for producing the liposomes. They are, they are not particularly uh, easy for us to use because they do mess up the instrument. Um, and so they, they, they prevent um, digestion, all this kind of stuff. Um, but to be honest, it was a, it was a, it was a, we followed pretty much the same pathway on reacting with, with the liposomes. We didn't need to clear or anything like that. The, the, the conflict went straight into the instrument. So um, I can't tell you too much about it really. Uh, the, the lipid composition was a little bit important to get right, but of course, um, that was that was trial and error, and I can't tell you too much about that as we didn't do it. Any of us using photo crosslinkers? Uh, yeah, we have used some, that. That's gearish. So we have used some uh, photo crosslinkers in the past. Andy Holding used some of those to look at Big D, I think, uh, um, some time ago with Simon Bullock. Um, yeah, it's 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 really what you're trying to do. There there are a number of different crosslinkers out there now. These these kind of um, uh, second generation ones like the, the kind of the, the cleavable reagents, but there are also these phosphoselective reagents uh, coming out of uh, uh, out of Sheltner's lab, um, and I think there will be some more developing along the line. But potentially, you know, what would be great is if you know we looked a little bit about using um, uh, not only photo crosslinkers but bitinylated, you know, so that you could maybe get a handle on it and pull it down. The problem there is that that's quite a bulky reagent, quite inflexible and you didn't get quite as much information um, so it wasn't quite as useful as we thought um, but I think there will be some more third generation reagents coming along and, and, and they're going certainly they're going to be helpful. Uh -huh, hang on could you comment on the molecular weight limits of the okay right so essentially with either technique there are no limits on 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 molecular weight or size of complex of course, with HD exchange, there is because the more complicated the mixture you have of peptides, the more overlap you're going to get, uh, which is why we're doing high mobility. So there, there is a little bit in terms of what you can get out of it. So I should tell you, we've done HD exchange on complex one, so 45 on the bovine enzyme, so 35 subunits. And we get some reasonable information. There's, of course, the, the membrane was the ending subunits, which is pretty difficult. But those extra membranous globular subunits and some of the others actually within that heel, uh, we do we do get some reasonable information. So theoretically, there is no limit, and uh, certainly for crosslinking, you know, um, we we we've, we've been doing stuff on the ribosome, um, uh, so, you know, that 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 isn't that isn't isn't an issue. Um, what we started to look at recently um, is another form of ion mobility. Uh, we've, we've been doing some experiments with, a with waters uh, on, on their cyclic instrument. So rather than having a linear uh, ion mobility cell, it, it's like a ferris wheel, it's a ring, it's a cyclic IMS. And of course, you know, the separation that you get, the resolution is dependent on the distance, the length of your tube, okay? So if you make it cyclic, it's longer. Um, so in fact, the square of that distance. Um, so, what we've done is with complex one, we've, we've looked at those experiments there and for proteins that we would get maybe 60, 70 percent coverage on our synapse, we're now up at sort of 90 percent coverage on, 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 the, on this cyclic MS. So that's, that's quite an interesting way of looking at it. And essentially our resolution on the synapse we have here is 40 in our prime ability. And, and for the cyclic, it's more like 80 to 100. So, okay, so we've got an increase in resolution, which is helping us out there. But in theory, um, we can look at anything in terms of molecular weight. So proteins have flexible dynamic regions that are important for function um, and which are difficult to study by, yeah, well, that's right. So we can, we can, we can um, essentially look at those unstructured regions. We can see which are unstructured. Um, and potentially map those in, into a cryem where you you know you don't have density there. I should say the other approach, which Glenn has talked about in the past, which we haven't looked at so much, is if you're having difficulty 
and I guess perhaps it gets less important as cryo takes over. Um, if you're having difficulty crystallizing a protein, you know, you can, you can adopt this approach of, of excising um, disordered regions. And so with HGX exchange, you can first of all identify those regions that you might want to cut out, but then you can do the exchange of your modified protein and check that it's still folded in the same way, okay? So that, that's, that's another approach that you can take for, for helping with, with experiments. I think, I think um, John Burke had a paper on that a few years ago. In that case, Chris and Stephen, I think, I think we're done. That was the end. Well done for everybody for making it to the end of these biophysical technique talks. Um, I think attendance has been, been pretty good this year. Um, on, online has certainly uh, upped the numbers. So I hope you've all enjoyed it. And uh, next year there'll be something new. Uh, it, it'll, they'll have different slides um, and probably much more information. So, uh, so come along next year. If you've attended this year's, come along next year because it'll be different. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, great. Thanks, Mark. No worries. I think. Sort hang of on, hang on, hang on. Wait, wait, wait. Ching Hong's got a question. What's the minimal material required for X linking? Ah, okay. Well, so. Um, depends how big your complex is. We've looked down sort of as low as maybe one to two micromolar of some really large complexes. Um, so you're looking at maybe a couple of micrograms per microliter. Uh, if you're doing it with Yuri, he'll want at least 50 micrograms of protein upwards. I think recently the stuff he did with Andrew Tartar, which has just been published, he wanted 200 micrograms of the hinge region uh, of, of, of dynactin. Okay, so, but generally, we're trying to work with lower and lower amounts, okay? Because we want to stay competitive. Oh, that's the wrong word. We want to stay um, uh, on, in line with cryo -M. I mean, it used to be with crystallography that you, you know, you needed much more material for crystallography than we did for mass spec. And that is changing really. So, you know, you probably need less material for cryo -M than we do for, for, for the mass spec technique. So we're trying to reduce the amounts we need all the time. Um, but you're really looking at sort of, you know, um, two to five micromolar kind of amounts, okay? How much did you need for complex one? Well, uh, complex one wasn't limited because you can prepare that in buckets from, from hearts. So complex one is prepared generally at 20 mg per mil. So yeah, that wasn't a constraint. Uh, of course, if we started to look at it from something a little bit smaller than a, a cow or a sheep, uh, we'd probably end up in trouble, but the, we, we have, um, uh, technical term buckets of complex one. And what we've been doing with complex one as well, which I didn't describe, what we've been doing on the on this cyclic IMS is complex one adopts a couple of, in the crime you can see it in two different conformations, an open and a closed. And the idea is that that might be involved in, in activity, okay, in, in actually some kind of catalytic state. So it kind of, um, if you imagine it had the L shape, so it sort of opens and closes, but it doesn't really do that. It's more of a twisty kind of thing. And we've, we've, we've looked at those two states. You can lock those states with temperature and then reaction um, assist sustain with NEM. Um, we've looked at those two states on this cyclic and we can see some, some changes in, in, in interaction, um, uh, but, uh, some of those subunits at the interface of the, of, of the globular and the, and the transmembrane domain. So yeah, it's, uh, yeah, we're not restricted with complex one. We have buckets and stuff. Very good, well done guys. Well done Chris and Stephen for organizing these. I think you've done a, yeah, as usual, Splendid job. See you later.